welcome to the third winter evening at the Tunbridge Library. Um, first, a little bit of housekeeping. There are refreshments on the table in the other room, which you saw as you came in. There's a donation jar on that same table. Um, two weeks from tonight, the next program will be Giovanna Peebles, retired state archaeologist, and she will be talking about 40 years as a state archaeologist. <coughs> Anything else about the winter evenings, Kay? <coughs> books. Yes, there is a table of books over here on the side, and Bill Mayers will be there. Uh, the cookbooks <coughs> are in, to support the Vermont Beekeeping Association, and the other books were all written by Bill Mayers. Now, speaking of Bill Mayers, I first met him about five years ago when he was president of the Vermont Beekeepers Association. Uh, subsequent to that, he was president of the Eastern Apicultural Association, which is a consortium of eastern states. Um, the rest of his biography, I'm afraid I'm going to have to read you off the back of this book. If I told you everything he's done, we wouldn't have any time left for his talk. Um, Bill Mayers is a writer and commentator for Vermont Public Radio. He's also sorry, former president of the BBA, former high school teacher, and was a member of the Vermont House of Representatives from 1985 to 1991. An avid runner, reader, choral singer, and traveler. He also has a great passion for history, philosophy, and fishing. Um, he's the author of many books, including Bees Besieged and Fishing with the Presidents. And here's a, a quotation I'll read you by Frank Bryan, professor of political science. Bill Mayers is one of the most interesting men in Vermont, a rare Renaissance man in a national culture that's beginning to look and smell like an uncapped landfill. There's nothing I could add to that, so I'll give you Bill Mayers. Well, thank you, Chuck, and thanks, Frank, uh, with whom I wrote four books, which was a wonderful experience. Well, thank you, uh, people of Tunbridge, for having me for. Maybe the first time I've ever been to Tunbridge when I haven't been working the fair in the beekeeper's booth, but it still is wonderful to uh, be here among you and try to persuade you that uh, talking about bees uh, is like dealing legal drugs. I mean, it's just so much fun to try to um, excite people about these wonderful creatures that I have um, followed and um, tried to care for over almost, well, more than 40 years. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is spend about half of the time, 20 minutes or so, talking about bees generally, uh, what they're like, what, what problems they face, uh, some of the history of beekeeping, and uh, then I'd like to talk about uh, the work that I've been doing in Central America <coughs> to help coffee farmers learn to keep bees as a source of supplemental income. Um, so, uh, you know the first one? Okay, so these are just facts. I'm not going to read them to you. You can just read them for yourselves. But, you know, you, you start with really interesting things that you pick up about bees. And, and um, the one I would call your attention to most is honeybees will travel two to three miles from the hive through forage for nectar and pollen. Well, the result of this is that um, don't ever, it's very hard, those of you who are beekeepers, to say I'm producing only uh, blueberry honey or apple honey, is that, particularly in Vermont, there's such a mixture of floral sources that almost all the honey is going to be what we call varietal. And my, uh, my marketing pitch is, what's the smartest dog? The smartest dog's a mongrel, because it's got all that genetic mix in it. So what's the best honey? The best honey is varietal honey, because it has all these different floral sources. And what's the best varietal honey? It's mine. <laughs> Next. Um, okay, uh, this again, this is, a, this is for class, but it's, it's important to know just a couple of other statistics that there are 20,000 species of bees in the world, 4,000 in North America, but really only four are, are social and produce commercial quantities of honey. Three of those are in Asia, and one is in the rest of the world. That's the European honeybee that we... Um, we beekeepers in the States and really Latin America and Europe deal with. But 
one of the problems, well, I mean, I'll come back to one of the problems, the reason why beekeepers have to know about one of these Asian honeybees. Okay, next. Okay, so what do, what do, what do bees produce? Well, of course they produce honey. Um, but they, uh, and they produce it in different forms. And later on, I hope you'll be able, I brought four different kinds of honey from different places, but each with a different texture so that you can get some difference, of, some sensation about the difference in, in honeys. Um, um, so when you want to buy honey, you don't want to just have plain old yellow honey. You want to try, if you've got different colors, the later in the season, the more there's wildflower, the darker the, the honey is. But besides the honey, bees produce or collect pollen and they collect propolis. Propolis is a natural resin. They don't produce it themselves. They collect it from trees, which they use to um, seal their hive during the wintertime. They produce royal jelly, which is food for all the bees for the first three days, and then particularly for the queen, for all of her life inside the cell. And uh, of course, they produce venom, which is collected and used. And they produce wax for the construction of their hives, but then people, of course, use it for a variety of um, uh, cosmetics. Think of birds, bees, whole industry, a whole company built upon bees' wax. Um, and in Central America, which we'll talk about later, the uh, bees, or a beehive, is referred to as the farmer's pharmacy because a number of these products are used for various health or homeopathic medicines. Okay, next. Now, uh, we like to say that, or I like to say, that there are four ages of humans' relationship with bees. The first is what is primitive beekeeping, when the, uh, really up until the Egyptians, the beekeepers went looking, or not beekeepers, but, but humans had two sources of sweets, fruits, and honey. And to get the honey, they had to go and steal them from, from uh, wild uh, uh, cones. That the, there was no, um, how shall I say, there was no uh, uh, colonies. They didn't, they didn't have any way of doing this until, of keeping the bees themselves until the Egyptians came along. So the humans and the bees were in relative equivalence. And this, this is a, a, a cave painting in uh, in, uh, in Spain of how people would go after the wild uh, comb. Well, then the Egyptians began to, to make crockery pots about 4,000 years before Christ, and, or 3,000, and they, would, they were able to entice the bees to, to go inside and both collect honey, they, they produce combs naturally, and uh, so they could put both their brood so the, the queen could, act, could actually lay in that crockery pot, but also the bees could work the other end and collect, and collect honey. And they would put these uh, crockery pots on boats and go up and down the Nile following the harvest. Well then also, go to the next one if you could. Um, in Europe, so, so that is the, that's the beginning of the second era. The second era is when people humans began to make containers for the bees. Then in Northern Europe, people use logs, they use the skeps. We've all seen this, this shape. Uh, it's used for many uh, businesses to show that they relate to bees. Well then, in the middle of the 19th century, along came a, a congregational minister in Philadelphia and he was among uh, a number of people over a 200 year period who kept thinking, oh, so the way to get the honey out of, out of these uh, uh, places in Europe, you had to kill the bees. And then you take the honey out and, and eat it. And a lot of people said, we don't want to kill the bees. We want to find a way to keep, get the bees and the honey separate. And so Langstroth figured out that, if you can go to the next slide, I think. No, sorry, go back to that one. He figured out that if you look at a, if you ever saw a, a, a comb, in the, a honeycomb in the wild, and you measure the distance between those combs, it'd be three-eighths of an inch. 
And, it, and the bees replicate that. And so they are creating naturally a bee's hallway so that the bees can work both sides of this comb. And he said, well, if we can put comb between uh, wooden, uh, these wooden, uh, what, they, what we call frames, slats, that are exactly 3 eighths of an inch wide, that we can then pull them out, shake the bees off, take the honey, and it was really the splitting of the atom for, the, for beekeeping. It was the, really the creation of a beekeeping industry, because within 10 years, this technology was all over Europe, was all over the United States, and that created the third age of bees, which was industrial beekeeping, which grew um, um, until, well, through to, to, the, to the present. And then the, the fourth age, let you go, if we can go one more. Yeah. Um, the fourth age of beekeeping for the, in the United States began in the 1980s. And that was a, a mixture of the industrialization of pollination by bees of a number of crops and the arrival of a parasitic mite from Asia. It came from one of the Asian honeybees. So these two things happened, and that we are still living with them. I mean, the pollination has, has allowed the beekeeping industry to survive, but at the same time, everybody has to deal with these parasitic mites. Now, one number to remember is, well, not this first one. This is, you'll hear people say one-third of every bite that you eat comes from the honeybees work. Well, that's a little hyperbolic. But there are a number of crops, 14 or 15 in the United States, that are um, completely dependent upon bees for pollination. And so if you, if you did take away the bees, you'd have what a friend of mine in Texas calls a lot of potatoes and tough beef. You wouldn't starve, but your diet would be a lot thinner uh, without them. Um, but what this is, this is a bit of a pact with the devil. Because today, as we speak, 60% or two-thirds of all the bees in the United States are in California doing what? Um, Pollinating? Almonds. Almonds. Airline finger food, right? I mean, you know, is it necessary for your diet? But it's great for bee. I mean, it's great for beekeepers because these pollination fees have helped to pay for the infrastructure for people like me who have only 15 or 20 hives, or other people have only two hives, um, to pay for the queen breeding, to pay for some of the research. So the value, overall value of bees for pollination is about 60 times what the value of, of honey is that's produced in, in the United States. $400 million worth of honey and $30 billion worth of pollination. Um, and, uh, but with that has come the fact that beekeeping itself on an industrial scale, you know, you take all the beekeeping in the United States, which is 80% 80, 80 or 85% of the hives in the United States are owned by guys who do this for a business, a business and there are only about 1,000 of them. But it means that they... <laughs> Uh, if they don't survive, the rest of us we really will not survive as, as beekeepers. Uh, but to do this, they have to put their bees on trucks in the middle of the winter, take them to California, get them out of California, and move them all around. And uh, they have become part of the globalization, not just of the market for honey, but more importantly, the globalization of pests. And it's not just the big guys, it's we small people. So we are living in a globalized world where every year uh, there's, there's a new pest that is threatening bees around the world, not just the United <coughs> States. But the, the trouble, the, the, the challenge for these big guys particularly is when they're moving their hives around, they're going from one flu clinic in Florida to another flu clinic in California. And they're, put, and they're make, put, putting a lot of stress on the bees uh, so that some of them have to, I don't know, um, some of them have to actually replace their queen twice a year. Um, so, uh, okay, going on the next, well, actually go back, go back to the, so these are some of the, these are some of the, um, the major crops. 
uh, that, that are. So if you look at those and you say your diet, uh, you can't live without those, okay, then, then you really would be um, suffering because of the, the disappearance of the bees. And this is just, a, if you can see this, this is how the, the, the bees are, are transported. 500 hives on the back of a semi. You know, and every month or so in the wintertime, you'll hear, you'll see on television, oh my God, you know, a truckload of bees, it's out there, you know, it's, it's shutting down the traffic on I-90 from 25 miles. And it's, it's true, but it still is. These guys are taking these bees to California, to North Dakota, North South Dakota, and that's the way they've done it. They, they can't, uh, so they put them on, they put a plastic netting over all the hives, and they just dead deadhead it right from Pennsylvania or to, to California. They take them, take the the, uh, uh, the covering off. They put them down right in the middle of the orange groves. And by ten o'clock, the bees have figured out where the where the blossoms are. I mean, they're amazing creatures. Okay, next. Okay, yeah, next, next. Okay. So, so you, you probably have heard, starting about 2006, there was this phrase, or this acronym, CCD, Colony Collapse Dis Disorder. And beekeepers named, used that name because there was no smoking gun, no biologic smoking gun. They couldn't point to a single pest. They couldn't point to a particular disease. They couldn't point to uh, one thing, and, uh, but, what, what happened is, and this is a little misleading, if you're a beekeeper, you, uh, I mean, I, even before this, I, I used to lose 10 or 15% of my hives in the winter. And, um, but to, to double that uh, is serious business. Um, but what happened, the, the CCD was really a perfect storm which uh, involved uh, pathogens, which were parasites and viruses, um, pesticides that not just uh, uh, that were being applied in the ambient areas of around the bees, but pesticides that the beekeepers themselves put in the hive in order to deal with these parasitic mites. So they made this awful pact with the devil in order to kill off the mites that were killing their hives. But over time, the mites began to be, as they always do, they became resistant to the chemicals that were used, and there was only a fairly small number of these chemicals that were, um, that, that were effective. And so it is an incredible um, chase, um, um, I don't know what you'd say, a, uh, um, a uh, vicious circle. Well, it's more than a vicious circle. It is a vicious circle in the sense that they, that they've even gone back to some of the early, chem early chemicals to try to see if they have recovered some of their effectiveness. So it, but it's a constant battle. Every year, these, these professional beekeepers who've got 5,000, 10,000 hives are, are struggling to keep them alive long enough to get them to California and back. And then, um, uh, because the varroa mites weaken their immune system. Now, I, again, as a, uh, just a, a sedentary, well, I'm sedentary in that I don't move my bees. I'm in better shape. Anybody who can keep their bees in their own backyard is in better shape than, than these guys. Yeah. But we don't, I mean, we're all so small that we, we don't have to move them. Um, okay, next. Can you explain the yeah. top picture? What the oh. top picture is? Oh, uh, yeah, well, I think, I think this... Oh, yeah, it is a, uh, this is probably a sprayer uh, on the end of a tractor, and they're spraying this canola. Is that right? Does that look like right? Yeah. You all? Okay. Uh, yeah, and this is, this is spraying in the almond groves. Uh, this is just a normal picture of a bee. Uh, but actually, go to that next slide, because it does uh, show this, this, uh, your vicious circle of the different forces on honeybee health. And so um, we, I talked about the monoculture of just raising one, one crop uh, and uh, talked about 
Well, nutrition is a big problem. These guys, when they take the, the, the bees out to California, there's no natural pollen out there, so they have to feed them a, a, a substitute pollens made out of soy flour. They have to pump them up with high fructose corn syrup instead of regular nectar uh, to keep them alive. Then there, as they say, pesticides outside the hive, pesticides inside the hive. Um, these acaricides uh, are the pro are the pesticides that are used inside the hive. Um, there are beekeepers' practices, uh, uh, which vary all over the map. Uh, pathogens that are outside the hive, resistance. So the bee, the bees are, they struggle. Mm -hmm. And and every year we go into the winter. I was talking earlier with, where's Ryan? Yeah, with. With Ryan, and so the common beekeeping question is, well, how are your bees? And then the second question is, well, how many of them got through the winter? And uh, some people say, well, I got half of them through the winter, or I got three quarters of them through the winter. And then people start to roll their eyes. And did you really do that? So, well, I don't know, maybe two thirds. Uh, um, but it is, it's, uh, you know, I don't know about raising cattle, but if if, if um, dairy farmers stood around and said, well, you know, I lost a third of my herd through the winter. That'd be pretty serious stuff. Um, now, the one good thing about bees is you can split the colony in the springtime. And it's a common practice both for professionals and for we amateurs. Is you, if you can, you either let the hive split itself, or you, there are techniques for taking frames out of one hive and setting them aside and letting them produce new queen, or you can buy a queen and add it to a to, to set to the separated hive, and then you're back to what you started with, at least you try to be. Um, okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> this is well. This this is the greatest. This is enemy number one for the bees. This is a this is the parasite. It's a, it's about the size of a pinhead, red, and uh, you see it most uh, devastatingly on. Uh, pupa and, and larva of, of bees in the hive, and uh, they, they continue to, to cause the biggest problems for, uh, for all of us beekeepers. Okay, next. Okay, we'll, do, we'll just keep going. I mean, this, we're going through the see if there's any more. This is basically the three, we'll go back to the, the previous one, the first one. There. Now that one. Okay. So here's the, here's the queen. I mean, this is, we're not going to give you too much biology. But the queen is distinctly different. Um, this is, uh, of course, a Vermont queen because she's painted green. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a fit. Well, there are five colors that rotate every, every year, so yellow, green, white, red, and blue. So uh, this is the year, this, when this picture was taken, was the green year. But she, is, she does nothing except, except lay between 1,200 and 1,600 eggs a day. She can't feed herself, she can't groom herself, so these are her attendants. And without the queen, there's no colony. So she is really the, the sine qua non of the hive. And one of the neat things about queens is you can change the genetics of your hive in the space of a month. Well, a month and a half. You can replace this queen with one with different genetic makeup. And if she's laying, she'll replace all the bees in that colony in within six months, six weeks, or, or two months. So the whole nature of that colony would change. Um, okay, next. Uh, well, this gets a little technical, uh, but just a, a couple of you know good shots of, of what you what you as a beekeeper look for. You, you when you are looking at a hive and you look at cells, you want to see all of the, everything in the cells looking roughly the same, roughly the same age. And there'll be gradually, the queen is laying in a concentric circle, so there'll be a very slight uh, change in the age of the, uh, of the eggs or the uh, larva or the cappings, but this is a, this is a good, healthy looking uh, uh, cell, or a series of cells, okay? Uh, yeah, this is just showing how the, the, all the bees have wax glands that come out of their, uh, their sides, and, they, and at their particular age, 
which is only six weeks in the, in the summertime, they start to um, excrete these eggs that are really transparent. And they pull them off and they chew on them and they add enzymes and then that becomes the building blocks for, for not only building the comb, but then capping it. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then one of the one of the great things about about bees is in this short life of six weeks, they will go through a series of different jobs, starting with cleaning cells, transferring nectar from the outside into the into the into the cells, giving to into the brood. Then uh, they uh, guard the entrance. They uh, become part of the groomers and uh, care caregivers for the queen, and then for the last two two weeks of life, they go out to forage for nectar, pollen, and water. And they literally work themselves to death. Almost all of them die outside the hive because they'll just drop dead on their, on their flight home. They're carrying half their body weight of one of these substances. And this is a, a pollen that they've stored. This is nectar, which starts off as 80% water and ends up as 18% water. So there's a, they're, they're running these fans. I mean, thousands of little fans to bring the air through, take the moisture away, and reduce the amount of moisture to 18%, at which time they say it's, it's honey, and they cap it over. Okay? They yeah, guard, they guard. They go on arteries, fly, arteries, arteries and flights, forage. Okay, keep going. Okay, these are just a few pictures I, I took in different, different countries, they're just for grins. Uh, go back one if you could. This is China where they're actually pouring sugar water into the top of the hive. This is, uh, I'm not sure, I can't remember whether this was, this is probably early summer. It's pretty primitive. Uh, and this is 30 years ago too. Okay, next. This is, uh, this is Panama. Um, these are the meanest bees I ever encountered. They're on a scale of 10, these were 11. They chased us about a mile on a pickup truck. Uh, and, and it was really a, a function of bad beekeeping, because I'll show you later the word where people can work much more happily with them. But these were just left out and left to requeen themselves, and, um, and, and, and they just got meaner and meaner and meaner. You can see all these bees here. They have to, they're so mean, they have to use a, a double-sized smoker to, to keep them... Uh, um, okay. Now this is Mexico, um, where you can put all these hives together. They're all Africanized down there. They're all killer bees, but um, they're not. They're not uh, what the Hollywood movies make them out to be. These people can have figured out how to work them, and they're actually more resistant to varroa mites than regular European honeybees. Okay. Next. Yeah, this is in Macedonia, so you can. You can keep them in the house, on the house, on the house, okay, uh, Chile, next, uh, this is uh, Croatia, this is what bees do in the wintertime, if you were to open any hive today, you, you'd see bees would be like this, they'd be in a cluster about the size of a football, and, and what they do is, um, the, the queen's right in the center, and the, and the temperature right in the center is about 85 degrees, and these bees, Rotate position, so they're so they're, they're the ones on the outside aren't stuck. They they keep moving and exchanging places with the one ones on the inside, and they'll move up in the hive during the course of the winter, eating the honey that you have left in that honey in that hive for their sustenance. Okay. Yeah, I love this picture. I wish I could say I'd taken it, but you see, and it's got. Tough bees in Brazil, so uh, this guy uh, protected his... Yeah, okay, next. And then I just, I did just some um, um, pussy stamp with, with bee things on them. So I think this is Romania, next. It's Cuban, uh, next. Uh, Spain. See, that's that same image that was on the first slide. Okay. Okay. Ireland, Luxembourg, China, and uh, the end of that. Okay. Um, so, um, actually, if anybody's got any quick questions, I do this, then I can go start talking about Central America. Yeah. yeah. How are? How was the industrial? I mean, the commercial 
you know, in the natural, are they, you know, you know, you know part of the diseases going? Do they, uh, you know, are they combined or? Who? Does the the, uh, and the natural. Oh. Yeah. Well, I think the natural, I mean, if, if you're talking about people that don't use any treatment and are all organic, they're a fairly yeah. small cohort of beekeepers. And, and I don't think they would want to be anywhere near the commercial guys. No, are they affected by the same, you know, the natural species, you know, affected by the same diseases as the commercial? Oh, well, it's hard to say what the natural, what a natural bee is because the, these bees here, I mean, people talk about wild bees. Well, they really aren't wild bees that, I mean, there aren't any wild honeybees because our honeybees came from, brought from Europe in the 17th century. And there were some existing stingless solitary bees here, but they have never been commercialized. So when people talk about wild bees, they really mean feral bees, ones that have escaped from a, a hive somewhere. Okay, yeah? Could you just talk a little bit about the um, collection of the pollen and what happens in the hive with that? Yeah, um, so... Uh, the, the bees, um, the, the forage bees uh, practice, tend to practice what's called floral fidelity, which means if they get the, the message that there's a lot of pollen from these dandelions, there's also a lot of nectar from the dandelions, they'll tend to go and some of them will usually, I mean most of them will either do one or the other. They'll go and get the nectar or they get the pollen. And they take the, they, um, they pack it into these uh, little um, pollen sacks. They look like uh, sort of a, on a fighter, you know, like wing tanks, and they're right back in the back, and you can see them, and, and you, can, you can tell when they're, um, when they're bringing them back because they really stick out, whereas the honey or the nectar is brought into a honey stomach, and it's, it's out of sight, and then it's excreted back to other bees inside the colony. But when the... the Bee brings the pollen back, it's again is exchanged with one of these nurse bees. They take it and pack it into these cells, or they mix it with honey and make what's called bee bread, which is another food for it. But it's all done with the, well, mixture of the mouth parts and the, and the legs. Does that answer your question? That gets used up in the hive, that all that gets used up in the hive. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, well, if you're still, yes, sorry. Could you just talk a little bit about the different queen cells that they make? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, <it's> a <clears throat> you've all heard of bees swarming. And swarming is, is a natural, healthy expression of the bee's strength, or the hive's strength. And the colony runs out of room. And, uh, and, and so you, you really have too many bees. There's, there's kind of this race that goes on, at least in my house, in, in June, between the forager bees that are bringing in honey and the, the, the need of the queen to lay enough eggs to keep the bees growing to go out and do this foraging. So they're, they're in this race, and you as the beekeeper have to try to keep ahead of that. So there's always space for the queen to lay and also for the bees to bring in nectar. And um, so sometimes you get behind, or the queen is a year old or two years old, which is when she's more likely to say, uh, let's get out of here. So they start these preparations to, to leave the hive. And over two or three days, they, they make a series of cells on the bottom of the of frames that are, we call them swarm cells, and, and they either build them around eggs or they put eggs in there. And, they, and they're stuck out and they look like a peanut. And there are about 10 or 15 of these cells. So within, after about 12 or 13 days, if, it goes, if you don't do anything, half the bees with the queen leave. And then a day or two later, the first of those queen cells, the queen hatches out, then she goes around and stings all the other queen cells because there can only be one queen in the hive. So meanwhile, the other queen's gone with half the bees, and now this queen waits around for two or three days, then she goes out and gets mated in uh, 
in what are called drone congregation areas. It's like a street corner. And she goes and hangs out and gets laid 15 or 20 times. Uh, and, but it's really a good thing. You know, it's not promiscuity. It's, it's for the benefit of the hive because she needs the hive that, that she's going to um, be the, 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 the leader of needs to have all this mixture of genetic stuff to, to do all these different jobs. And if she misses out, she doesn't get to that street corner but once and only mates with half a dozen half a dozen drones, she's getting short on the sperm that she needs to, to make that colony, that colony really um, uh, strong. So that's the healthy way in which the queens make these cells. The, 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 the less healthy way is what's called supersedure or emergency cells. So if I were to mistakenly kill a queen uh, somehow, or the queen started to get old, and the colony senses this, and the colony puts, instead of putting the cells, these queen cells in the bottom, they put them on the sides of the frames. And again, you can look and see this develop. And it's the same process, but at, it, it, the, the existing queen doesn't leave. She stays, and then what can happen is the new queen, first queen hatches out, stings all the others, then she gets in a battle with the existing queen, and she might even lose that battle. Um, but so it's not a very good thing to have happen because you're not sure that um, that what's going to result from that is is a good thing. So what I do, what a number of other people do, is you simply get another queen from somewhere else and you requeen that hive because you know that either that queen that is weakening and you can see it in her in her laying pattern. So you say, well, I don't want to have this queen around. I don't want to keep her alive just for the sake of. You know, saying I've got this a queen that's alive, that's not the that's not the game. The game is to have a strong colony. So I would get another queen, kill the old queen, put the new queen in. But I mean, I'm good, but again, back to your question was that that's a different kind of cell that you can recognize when you when you examine the go inside a hive. Yeah. When you mentioned floral fidelity, does that mean if I buy honey and it says red clover? Uh, I, uh, I've sometimes sold uh, honey at uh, farmer's markets and I put blueberry on the side of the jar and I urge people to say, can't you taste the blueberries? And say, oh, yeah. <laughs> Not blueberry within 20 miles. Uh, so, you know, part of it is self-delusion uh, and part of it can be true. Um, I've got some, uh, uh, gosh, is it blue thistle? It's, it's, well, it's, it's a thistle, but it's, it's a very distinctive taste, and I think it is a that comes from Maine. So I think, but the trick is, if you're gonna if you're gonna pretend to do that, you have to take off the honey at the end of that particular flow, because the bees will go on looking for something else, and they'll keep filling up cells. And the way most of us mix our honeys. Um, it's it's going to be a, a real um, mishmash of, of flavors. I mean, I would I just would not pretend that I have a monofloral honey. Um, um, but there are some places you can get it. I mean, if, if you're in a place with a lot of eucalyptus, or tupelo, or clover, um, and it'll pass if it can pass the taste giggle test, um, try it. But again, I would go back and say just just. Love the local stuff, and buy from buy from around the neighborhood, and uh, they don't have to worry about where it's come from or what kind of labels on the package. Do you want to see a little bit about Central America? Yeah. yeah. This quick. Yeah, about um, commercial queens and whether or not they're um, get bred the same way. I'm sorry. What what about commercial? Commercial commercially bought queens. Yeah. Whether or not they're as strong um, for the hive. Well, I, I buy them from people who, who make, raise queens for a living. I mean, I, but it, it is true that most of the big queen breeders in the United States are serving these large-scale traveling beekeepers, and they they want uh, production, mm -hmm. and uh, and um, they're not interested in local condition. They've got to have something that would will work on these long trips uh, between Florida and so forth, but. I would much rather buy 
Vermont honey, or Vermont queens that are raised here mm -hmm. and accept somewhat less production, but at least they're going to survive. Mm -hmm. Are they already bred? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the next, it's the one that says uh, PSU presentation. That's all right. That's all right. I'm not sweating yet. <laughs> now, are you right around here? I live in Burlington. Burlington? Is all that pesticide showing up in the honey? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yes and no. Uh, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, there's a big debate. The, big debate about a, 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 a systemic pesticides called neonicotinoids, and a number of environmental groups have, have, uh, are using the bees as the poster child to ban these as a class. And I think it's a much more complicated story, because this, these are used in the canola fields of Canada in great numbers, and the bees are not suffering. And, and, uh, and yet there are some studies that say they're, they're having an effect on, on bumblebees. And the French um, maybe got the whole EU to ban, ban them years ago, but it doesn't seem to have solved the problem. So I think the jury's out on, on that particular family of pesticides. And we've always had problems with pesticides in different ways, but we also have to be re remind ourselves as beekeepers that we, do, we also put pesticides in our or have in the past, and at one time, 10 or 15 years ago, professional guys were putting um, or, or organophosphate in their hives, and that's really serious stuff in order to kill these mites. Well, now, fortunately, they're, they're not doing it anymore. So we're, we're um, I mean, we're partly to blame for the pesticides that show up from time to time in the, in the not in the honey, but in the, in the bees in the, inside the hive. Okay, so the, the background of this is about 10 years ago, I started going to uh, Central America, partly to practice Spanish, but also to look at the, at the beekeeping down there, and then through a nonprofit that I worked with, to begin to explore how beekeepers in Central America, Mexico, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, could help um, train coffee farmers to raise bees for, not for the pollination effect, because there's, there's a debate that I, I don't think it's a very strong connection that bees don't really, the pollination of, of coffee is largely windblown, but to add supplemental income to the, uh, to the farmers, for the farmers. And so uh, Dewey Cairn is a retired professor of beekeeping from University of Delaware. Alfredo Contreras is a second generation beekeeper from in Mexico. And he's, I think he's been the sort of Pied Piper of beekeeping in this whole uh, um, endeavor. So, okay, and this grew out of, this is uh, my friend uh, Rick Pizer, who used to work for Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, and we wrote a, a book together about his work at Green Mountain to increase the sustainability of coffee farmers. And uh, it's through him I got to know a number of these people in, um, in uh, Central America. Okay. And uh, we wrote this book about his life. And, okay. Uh, and he founded, and I'm on the board of this group called Food for Farmers, which is not just focused on bees, but on helping primarily coffee cooperatives, that is, groups of, of farmers, not estate farmers, to look and to explore ways of giving themselves supplemental income, one of which has become beekeeping. Okay. Uh, and uh, places that we've worked uh, in this area in Guatemala, uh, this area of Nicaragua, uh, <coughs> not there, let's see, um, this area, Chiapas, Mexico, and uh, and here in El Salvador, in El Salvador. Okay, 
Um, and this is a group of Mayan Indians in uh, southern Mexico. None of them could speak any Spanish. So there, the manager of their co-op was is Mexican, so he could speak Mexican and Soso, which is this language. And this is Dewey Cairn, uh, myself, and Alfredo Contreras, the Mexican. Uh, okay. So our pitch is that apiculture is a, I mean, you can read this, but I'll read it quickly for you, it's a livelihood strengthening strategy. Okay, to diversify a source of income, improve family health, it's open to both men and women, improves coffee production, preserves the environment, reduces migration, creates jobs, low tech, it's low tech, no land ownership, and helps preserve indigenous cultures. Well, that's quite a mouthful. Now, uh, so, so I'll talk about them a little bit individually. All right, so again, as he said from the beginning, it's to diversify income. So their, their baseline is coffee. These guys have been producing coffee for generations. And they're also diversifying the, the way in which they sell their, their, their honey. So um, their local markets where, I think this is a, a shampoo bottle, he's put it in. Uh, I've seen it in scotch bottles, in Coke bottles, um, and whatever else is, and it's sold right in the village where the, the farmers live. Uh, because the beekeeping is not for everyone. And there's a bell curve in which some become better than others. And, uh, but in this, this case, this group, there were more, farm, excuse me, more farmers who took up beekeeping than, than not. But uh, many of them stayed at the local market because they found that they could earn just enough money to, to add to their overall income and they didn't want to go to the next step, which is another co-op that decided well, we're, we're going to brand ourselves. We're going to not just have, we're going to keep our coffee uh, right here, but we're going to also develop a brand which they called La Cañada, which is the name of the valley where they're located. And so they had honey, they had uh, uh, soaps, they had lip balm, they had propolis, they had venom, and all with this sort of standard label. And then, and then they sold it in a little kiosk in different parts of that particular state of Mexico. Then these guys in, in Nicaragua decided after four or five years that, that honey really made some sense for them. So they gave up coffee entirely and went to, went to honey and got organic and fair trade certification. And these barrels are headed for the EU. So they're selling it to Belgium and Germany. Uh, this is um, 200 or so. Uh, Nicaraguan, formerly formerly coffee farmers. Okay. Okay, improves health. I mean, you know, isn't honey better than just sh sugar? Of course it is. All right. Look at those smiling faces. <laughs> and here, this uh, that same company that had the little kiosk, they got a contract from the Mexican government to produce uh, 12 million of these little sacquettes of honey, which were put into school lunches or school breakfast. Um, okay. Next. Uh, the great thing about uh, uh, our friend Alfredo Contreras is when he was, he would go into communities to, to teach this beekeeping and he ran up against a lot of machismo men who said, oh, well, no, we're not going to let the women do it, even though they wanted to do it. So he just would take the women aside and he'd do a separate class with them. And he ended up saying, well, for the most part, they were better than the men because they were more careful. And, and once they got over the stinging, uh, they really were better than the men. Um, so, uh, okay, next. Uh, and this is a big debate, is to whether, you know, when, when I'm with one kind of audience, I'll say, oh yeah, you know, bees really help pollinate the coffee, and other audiences say, no, it's, it's, not, it's not true, because the scientific community is, is um, split on this. There's one guy from Brazil who's made a whole career on saying how how much pollination helps coffee plants, but he's, he's, he's alone. Um, so you can, you can use this or not, as you will. Okay. Uh, they help protect the environment in that they, now, by now, remember, these are not a native species. People talk about invasive species or alien invaders. This is, 
as it is up here, the honeybee came from Europe. So the Spanish brought honeybees to Latin America. And the pilgrims, or their descendants, brought bees to the colonies in the 17, what would it be, 1650s. Uh, but they, they now uh, pollinate so many plants that they do help, uh, not just out in the open, but also in the areas around the villages. And uh, you asked about the pollen. Here's a pollen basket. See, look at that. Um, okay. Um, they, uh, you know, as long as you got people who can find viable incomes in the countryside, um, they don't move to the cities. And uh, this is a, this picture just shows how they have brought these what are called nucleus colonies, first up in a truck to one altitude, then they put them on a donkey to, for another altitude, and then uh, they go up as farther than the donkey can go, and then they put them on their, on, uh, and carry them on the back of their, on their, on their own backs. But this is my favorite picture of all I've ever taken here because what it shows is this woman, this Tzotzo woman in, my, in uh, Mayan, in uh, Chiapas, and she's, of course, sewing the veil for her husband. And in the background is uh, a patio where they are drying the coffee that they have um, harvested. And this family, in, in its normal year, would produce 300 kilos of coffee and 300 kilos of honey. Uh, now within that co-op, the range was, was quite large. Some people didn't do any honey and did all coffee. Some people did even more honey than coffee. But that was the great thing, is it let, they let people decide how they were going to respond to it. But to them, they said, this makes real economic sense for us. <clears throat> okay. Uh, now, it is, beekeeping is, is, is pretty low tech. I mean, we're still using the technology, the, the three or four basic inventions in beekeeping from the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, but it means that you can use a... Uh, machete is your hive tool. Uh, and you can do it without gloves. Look, Mom, no gloves. Uh, uh, he is wearing a veil, and he's got a smoker here. But uh, the other wonderful thing about bees is you don't have to own land. Bees are traveling two or three miles. Uh, you've got the use of all this uh, other people's land without paying for it. <laughs> um, and, the, and, and I... I don't know if this is true, but somebody, somebody swore it was true that he'd come across a group in Nicaragua called um, uh, homeless beekeepers who would keep their hives on the roadside. And uh, they were mean enough so that no one was going to stop and, and steal them. Uh, and they would get the honey. Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Makes a good story, but I don't know how true it is. Uh, but, but this is... This is this is basic beekeeping. I mean, this is what I do in my basement in the, in, the, in the wintertime, is I put frames together exactly this way, wiring pieces of wood together, and then adding a wax foundation. Um, okay. Uh, now, there's another... <clears throat> before European bees were brought to um, the New World, uh, there were, and still are, stingless bees. Two major species, one called Melopony and one called Trigona. And enough so that they uh, had a, um, these are uh, pre-Columbian art renderings of those two kinds of bees. And those bees also uh, are, come in uh, smaller, they're, they're smaller hives, and they don't produce nearly as much honey but you can get a lot more money for the, the, that particular honey. So Alfredo Contreras raises both kinds and is teaching the farmers to, to raise both kinds, again, letting them choose to see how they want to divide their time because they're, they're slightly different technologies, and, um, but it just shows you how long <coughs> this tradition goes back. Okay, next. Yeah, on the image. Okay. Uh, well, just if you knew a lot, it was all about bees. It didn't make a lot of sense to you, but we'll go on. 
but this is what their hive looks like. So it's like this uh, sort of chamber nautilus circular thing, and they actually the the honey is in is in these tubes here, uh, and this is the brood. So this is capped over capped over brood. Okay. Uh, okay. Free resource because uh, people pick up swarms and put them in a hive. Okay. Only Africanized. Yeah, it's all Africanized. They're all killer bees. Or so-called killer bees. Now, this is always a dramatic picture that I, if I want to scare people. These are my boots. This is one minute after standing in front of a really hot hive. I don't know if you can see all these little zits here. Uh, looks like a teenager's face, but it's really, uh, it, it, it's, it's um, you know, it's probably, we counted about 300. Um, but it was a tough, it was a hot, hot uh, a, a, uh, but I didn't get stung at all because I was wearing protective clothing. And I, I egged them on, I kicked the hive. <laughs> okay. Uh, so again, but here is showing this uh, queen, if you can remember what the queen looked like before, very much the same shape. They're not, they're slightly smaller, but to the naked eye you can't really tell the difference. Okay. They are more resistant to varroa mites, and, and um, this, this makes a big difference because it, from a uh, expense standpoint, means that these farmers save themselves the extra expense of buying of what are called varroa sides or acara sides, um, and, uh, and it means that you know, the bees end up being healthier. They're not absolutely resistant, but they're more resistant than our bees up here. Okay. Uh, okay, so the same products we've had before. Okay, education. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's yeah. So we yeah, and so we use uh, several manuals. One uh, all in Spanish, of course, except for the ones that are in Sotil. And uh, but it's been fun. It's been, it's been uh, really satisfying. And yeah, I can answer more questions. If you want. Hmm. So what are your recommendations for the mites in this area? Uh, well, um, I would say the farmers for a long time have had this term, uh, IPM, Integrated Pest Management. And for bees, beekeeping, that, there are three components to that. One is, is you're manipulating the hive in order to reduce the number of mites, the sort of physical manipulation. Then there's breeding buy queens which are resistant to, to the mites. And as a last resort, use some sort of chemical as benign as possible and uh, in order to knock down the mites to get them to a, a, it, what we call an economic threshold. And um, so that's what I do. I mean, I use all three techniques. I use as few chemicals as I can, but I do use one at least once a year because I, I just don't believe it'll survive without it. Um, but there is a decent range of more benign chemicals. One's based on thymol, thyme products. One is uh, oxalic acid. One is, uh, is formic acid. And um, I think between the two and uh, between those three and rotating them is, is uh, sensible and um, largely effective practice. Yeah. What, what do you think about a screen uh, bottom board? I, I have them. I use them on all my hives. Um, and I think it might help somewhere between three and five percent. I mean, because you get some of the phoretic mites dropping off the hive, and if they go through the screen, they can't get back onto the bees. Um, and I think it adds to the the ventilation of the hive. But I certainly wouldn't use it alone because most of the mite problems are in the the drone cells, and you got to figure out some way to get get them done. Uh, but one of the, I know this is a little technical, but it only takes 15 seconds to explain. But one of the things that Germans developed 20 years ago was what's called drone trapping. And because the mites congregate in the drone brood, because it, it's 24 days and not 21 days, they'd love to go in there. So 80% of the varroa go there. And so what the Germans figured out was if you pull a frame that's covered with that kind of brood on it, pull that out of the hive, get rid of those, give the drone, give the brood to the chickens, 
uh, or freeze it. But anyway, otherwise you're killing the, the varroa and then you put that frame back in there. And so you've gotten rid of some of the mites. You never get rid of them all. Anybody that says you can get rid of them all is a fool. Um, but it is a way of re reducing the overall numbers. Bill? Yeah? How many hives would you say the average Vermont backyard beekeeper has? Two, ten? We just had the inspector just last week estimated that there are between 1,200 and 1,400 beekeepers in the state, and there are somewhere between eight and 10,000 hives, but they're not evenly divided. There are three or four guys that have between them 3,000, 4,000 hives. So I would say that, I don't know, what do you think, Ryan? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, you know, I would say two to five. Um, I, 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 when, I, when I teach a class, I try to get people to start with two, even though it's kind of, people's like, God, you, I, mean, I can't even get my head around one, so why are you having a two? But the nice thing about two is your chances of getting one through the winter are better than having just one. And if you get two through the winter, then you can, or one through the winter, you can split it and be back to having um, two hives. But if you lose that one the first year, then most, not most people, many people say, oh, shit. You got me to spend five hundred dollars on these bees, and look what happened. Um, but um, but then I think most people sort of get to that level where they're they've got enough to give away. They might sell a little bit, and uh, they can um, you know have the satisfaction of living with these incredible creatures. I mean, we're talking about problems, but I mean, there's there's just no, you know you can use all your senses with bees. I mean, you just go work on bees, you touch them smell and taste and and you know they're just I mean they're they're the coolest thing around <laughs> of course isn't that right Nina yes okay but I want to add to your second to humans the most sophisticated communicator next to humans are what bees second oh. to humans the most sophisticated communicator well well, I mean, just studying the biology, and you know, they keep you humble because you're never going to le learn all there is to know. And and then when you're around, you're around a cool beekeeper like Ryan and Nina. I mean, you know, you died and gone to heaven. Yeah. Do you think bees set spheres from humans? That's a great question. I think it's not so much that. And people talk about going into a hive. They sense when you're afraid. What they yeah. sense is that if you're afraid, your movements get jerky. And you start to you, you bang stuff, and and then you you sort of try to pull the hot the frame out quickly, and that sets them off. And then they'll they'll, they'll go s start sending out an alarm pheromone that says this is not a friendly. Uh, <laughs> but but it's not that they're you approach them. I mean I mean what, one thing we try to do is get as soon as possible get people to to get rid of their gloves, start off and be comfortable. But as soon as you can get rid of the gloves, you've actually got much better control. The, the Germans have a great word, Fingerspritzgefühl, and, and it means you can, you can kind of pull the, pull the frames out, and, and, and you're actually causing a lot less disruption. And then if you get stung, you just kick off the thing. But if you get stung on a glove, the venom stays in the glove, and, you get, and it builds up. And, and so you go out there the next day, and they, they can still smell it. So you're going backwards. So as soon as you can, Get rid of the gloves, but start off and be comfortable. Get rid of the gloves. Yeah. yeah. Would, if, if you have two hives, would they be at two separate places? Oh, no, they'd be right, in, right in within two feet. Yeah. I mean, they're, I mean, people have great long lines of them. Two long lines, if you get more than four or five or six in a row, then the bees start going to the wrong hive, or, or they drift into the ones at the end. So you, you really want to keep them in groups of two, but I've got eight in one place and eight in another place and, and um, just, yeah, it just, you don't want them in a, in a row like troops right next to each other for straight across. Yeah? Um, you, you mentioned a number of uh, difficulties, both environmental difficulties and, and things that are, that are, you know, affecting them, colony and colony. If, you could, if your word could become law, what changes do you think need to be made in this fourth era of bees, like, to, to keep beekeeping sustainable, to keep it still possible, you know, decades to come? 
If I were what? If I were God or if I were the president? Or, if I were God, I'd get rid of Aromites. I mean, I, I, because I, you know, I'm not being flipped. I, I, I think that they, if you got rid of Aromites, the pesticide problems would be far diminished and you'd, you'd really have, I mean, there might be other things that would come along, but it is, it has shown an, an extraordinary, hmm, the word I want, um, um, sustainability uh, and, and imperviousness to all these different ways of trying to reduce its effect. And um, so, you know, I try to reduce the, um, reduce the effect of the, of the Baroa, uh, because I, I don't think it's, you know, when the Natural Resources Defense Council says, write to President Obama and the EPA and tell them to get rid of neonicotinoids, it's just, it's a false message. It's not going to solve the bee problems, and it's just, it's deceitful. You think it, uh, you think that bees will obtain a natural defense against them eventually, or? Well, I don't know. I mean, if, if, because we're asking them on this industrial scale to do some, some very heavy lifting. I mean, taking them 3,000 miles to California in the middle of the winter for almonds. I mean, and, and so maybe the, maybe the California drought is going to solve part of this problem. I mean, it's going to reduce uh, 750,000, no, it's a million and a half bee, bee colonies that are in California now. And, and uh, you know, how many more almonds... Can they grow? And can people eat? Yeah. It is 80% of the almonds in the world. I mean, they're, California is lucky in that regard. And the beekeepers are lucky that they're all those almonds. But you, you, you know that as we speak, the guys in the California Almond Board are looking for a way to have self-pollinating almonds. And if they can have that, then they'll say, bye-bye bees. Which may, I mean, you might say that's a good thing because it brings all the bees home. But... But it, it, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of moving parts in all of this. And, and it's easy just to sit here in, in Vermont and say, well, I've got my 20 hives and, and don't, I don't want to bother about that. Um, but I am still tied at the hip to the, the big guys. Yeah? Is the reason that they move them is because they're following the, the, the fruits, like yeah. in Florida, and then yeah. they're going to the almonds, and then they yeah. go to the Yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a really nice book by a guy named Douglas Wynott called Following the Bloom, mm. and, and he talks about that. So they, these guys who are doing this big time, they got really two bar, the ends of two barbells. One is almonds in California, the other is blueberries in Maine. Mm. And they'll be, these guys will be in both, but then they'll, they'll be in Florida, or they'll be in Texas, or they'll be in in uh, Minnesota, but yeah, they are following the bloom. It's just that almonds is by far the biggest demander of pollination services. Why don't they just have a big group there and a big group there and not have to move them? Out? Well, because there aren't enough, there isn't enough other forage for the, for the bees in California. There's 400,000 hives in California and then, so they're bringing in a 1.1 million and what the California beekeepers are saying to the guys coming in, it says, well, you know, you're done, you know, get out of Dodge, because you, you know, and uh, several years ago, there were people were burning some of the hives of these uh, squatters, beekeeping squatters who came in from other states and wanted to stay or poach on the local guys' forage positions. Yeah? What's the effect on native pollinators of beekeeping? Well, Native pollinators for what? I mean, there's, I mean, for like if you're doing it on a home scale and your bees are out in in wild beyond yeah. their own beyond gardens, are they out competing in other pollinators? Because so. I don't think they're going for the same stuff. Oh, okay. And the native pollinators are all almost all solitary. Well, I mean, I mean you've got bats, and you've got butterflies, and you've got bumblebees, but the I don't I've never heard that. The European honeybees are taking food out of the mouths of baby bats or baby <laughs> uh, butterflies. Uh, yeah? I, I've asked ecologists about that because it's one thing that I worry about also. And they don't have a clear answer. They can't say yes, but they can't say no either. Because the native, like the bumblebees in particular, are suffering for a lot of the same reasons, you know, in globalization and everything. So it's it's an un unanswered question, I think. Yep. They don't seem to be as many native bees around as they used to be. 
Well, there, it, it's true that the that bumblebees. I was just reading a, a paper yesterday that at least alleged or posited that the bumblebees were more susceptible to smaller doses, to sublethal doses of neonicotinoids than were the honeybees. Um, but they sort of stopped at the end of that and said, of course, as usual, more research needs to be done. Um, yeah? Which queen do you prefer? Oh, uh, well, I, I, um, I buy local queens mm -hmm. from a couple guys in, in Franklin County. And then I buy, uh, either I'll buy uh, Russian, uh, Russian uh, bred queens uh, from a guy in Louisiana, or I buy Carniolan queens from a guy in California. But I add them to my stock, so I'm not replacing. I replace all of my queens every year, but it's a mixture of replacement of, of new queens. Yeah? I've got blueberries, and we're just talking about bees pollinating blueberries. The only thing I've seen on my blueberry is bumblebees. I've never seen a honeybee on this. Really? Do you have any, any and no beekeepers nearby? Within two I, miles I, of you? I, have a, I keep a hive or two. But my uh, really? honeybees, never seen them in the blueberries. I've got about 15 or 20 blueberry plants. It's all bumblebees. Boy, I, I have, I'm, it's above my pay grade. I don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> my wife's got a few blueberry bushes in the backyard, and the bees. bees like them, so that's all I can say. But... Um, do, yeah. do you have any stingless ones, or do you do just regular? Oh uh, no, stingless would be too hard to raise. They're they're not native up here, and no, no. I for that amount of honey, I would I would raise them. No, I've got well, I got real sting bees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you do about bear control? Well, I live in the city. <laughs> but the guys who live outside, it's serious stuff. I mean, you've you got to have a real you know, $1,000 operation. You've got to put the stakes down three or four feet. And, uh, and one of our best young beekeepers is in Fairfax, and he's, he's invested this because it, he, he says it works. And, and he's seen these times when the bear would come up to the thing. He said, has this picture where the bear came up and he had a piece of bacon on the, on the wire. And, and the bacon's sort of still hanging there, but there's, there's dents right where the, the bear sh shocked its own feet right down into the, into the mud. It's about that deep, and then jumped up and, and then ran away. Uh, so yeah, I think anybody, I mean, there, there are bears in South Burlington. So yeah, I would say if anybody's got bears and, I mean, got bees in the countryside, you gotta, it's another investment. Thank you very much. Oh, you want? Sure. oh, I do have, um, yeah, I brought, I believe actually I brought four kinds of honey. And, and so I suggest you each get two sticks and use both ends of the sticks and then just uh, have some and talk about it with your neighbor. And um, you know, I don't need any praise, just, you know, smile. Thank you very much. Thank you.